By now it's safe to say that I know what I'm doing when it comes to recreating Five Nights at Freddy's games in Minecraft. By using command blocks, I've made working versions of the first six mainline games, and more recently the entirety of the Fazbear Fanverse game Five Nights at Candy's Remastered. Every single one of these maps has pushed my command block skills further and further, and all of them were challenging in their own unique way. But now with the release of Help Wanted 2 comes with possibly the most ambitious gameplay out of anything I've made so far, but I knew that I couldn't say no to an opportunity to recreate it in Minecraft. Help Wanted 2 is a massive game and undoubtedly much bigger than the first one. There's over 40 different minigames to complete which made it very difficult to know where to even start on a game of this size. And these games aren't just the same sit and survive formula from most of the other FNAF games, but instead it's a mix of brand new scenarios which includes gameplay mechanics I've not yet messed around with in Minecraft. So I'm going to have to use some features I haven't used before so that way I can recreate the gameplay as faithfully as possible. But while this might sound very intimidating in concept, I I'd be lying if I said I'm not really excited to get started. So let's get right into it and begin this project. Before starting on any of the gameplay, I thought it'd be best to build the main hub as it'll make things much easier for when we selected different minigames later on. No one like Help Wanted 1 which had us standing in one place, we're able to move to different corners of the pizzeria and interact with some of the objects. So I made sure to add in as much detail as I possibly could, using custom player heads and armor stands and even some map art for all of the different decorations. I even used a new map art technique where by putting a layer of glass over the void, when the map is placed onto an item frame it will turn the glass part transparent, meaning I can make patterns that don't take up a full block of space. Now this isn't even what the finished hub is going to look like, as Help Wanted 2 does something quite cool in that when we win certain minigames we can unlock a prize that will then be added to this pizzeria. For example you can see that all of the banners are default light grey, and that was done intentionally as sometimes if we win a minigame we can earn a poster that will then be added to this pizzeria. Something similar happens with some of the other attractions, like the discount ball pit can be put in this corner, as well as the fruit pudge and lemonade clown which can also be added. Then finally is of course up on the main stage where the gallery has been set up, where once we win a minigame we'll unlock the animatronic related to that level, where then we can view the model of it up on the main stage in more detail. All of that will be things I'll add as I finish making each of the different levels, so for the time being I'm only focusing on the gameplay in the hub with a core mechanic being movement. I mentioned that we can go to different parts of the pizzeria, but it's not exactly free roam. Instead what we can do is teleport to the those places by looking at them and then pressing a button. Now this is something that didn't need to be overly complicated, so what I decided on was to use the inventory and to use items to move around. Each player head is labeled and represents a different area, and by throwing them, a command block will activate a teleport command to take us there. Now I still need to go over one last bit as the princess quest item works a little bit differently than the rest. So first of all, we're not actually able to access the princess quest arcade machine until we unlock it with the faz wrench, so when we start the minigame we're not going to be able to throw this item, meaning we're not going to be able to go in front of Princess Quest. Secondly, we're not able to directly teleport in there from any side of the pizzeria. So for example, if we're standing all the way in front of the kitchen, we're not going to be able to throw the Princess Quest item as we don't have the right angle at it. So what we'd have to do instead is go to the Cupcake Bonanza section where we could see the Princess Quest arcade machine, or more likely go all the way to the Faz Wrench Conduit, where there we'll have direct access to the Princess Quest arcade machine, so that way we'll be able to play the minigame. Now since I'm using the main inventory as a core gameplay mechanic, I do want to make it look a bit more presentable and not have these 18 empty inventory slots. So what we're going to do is have all of these glass panes from this chest here copied over to our inventory just like these items are, so that way it makes the inventory a lot nicer to look at. And now you can see what that looks like now that it's been fully added, and whenever we throw any of these glass panes, they're going to be instantly replaced so that way they're always going to be there in the inventory whenever we're in the hub. Now you'll also notice these other grey glass panes that I've added to the main hotbar, and these do the exact same thing, as I wanted to limit the amount of inventory space we could have, as instead of having 9 slots available, I just wanted to limit it down to 3 items that we could hold at once. This is mainly just so that when we unlock different items later on after beating levels, we're not going to be able to hold the Faz Wrench, the Faz Blaster, and the other launcher at the same time, and we're only limited to a few items at once. With that aside, let's now take a look at the main feature of this build, that being the selection 
information screen to show us all of the mini games. Now while I'm definitely not going to recreate them all in this video, I am still going to have every level show up in the menu so that way they're ready to go when I do eventually make them. My idea starts with this sign, which I recently found out can be interacted with by a player and send a command output, meaning we can power something by clicking on it. This will be how the menu screen appears, which I'll be using a chest in a minecart for. I haven't used one of these since I built my FNAF 6 map, and they were very useful for having all of the different menus appear for different parts of the game, and this here is going to be no different. Inside of it are the six labeled items for the six different minigame folders, backstage, food prep, staff only, fazcade, ticket booth, and sister location. By throwing one of these items, the current minecart chest will be replaced with another, which will then have all of the individual levels inside. This is the most important part, as all of these items will start the minigames once we throw a specific one. Now obviously not everything is unlocked at once, as we have to beat a level to unlock more, so until we do so, these levels will be replaced with a lock item that stops us from playing the minigame. So I'll have to make these levels in the order that they become available, and for this episode, I've decided on building Bonkabon, Cold Storage, and finally, Ballora Gallery in Sister Location. Starting with the most simple of the three, Bonkabon is more of a minigame to have fun playing instead of being focused on the horror side of things. It's like Whack-A-Mole but with animatronics that will jump scare you if you don't score high enough each round. The game starts off pretty simple, with characters like Bon Bon and Bonnet, but after round 1, plush babies will start to appear which need to be hit 3 times before they're pushed back fully. And during all of this chaos, we also need to watch out for Helpy popping out, as accidentally hitting him will cause us to lose points. These are all of the armor stands for each animatronic. We have 5 different Bon Bons, 5 different Bonnets, 3 different Helpies, and then 3 different plush babies. So what I need to do next is make a system that will teleport a random amount of them up into one of the 15 positions in the machine, and then have them teleport back down again after a few seconds, and then have that cycle repeat. Setting this up wasn't very complicated, but it still took a long time to do because of the amount of lengthy commands that made sure everything worked the way I wanted. The system starts with a scoreboard timer, which powers this randomizer once the countdown reaches zero. When this happens, an armor stand will randomly teleport to one of four others, which is going to determine how many bonbons are going to appear at once. Now getting the animatronic armor stands to move only needed one teleport command for each, but the command itself is very specific, since I needed to make sure that the bonbons could appear at any of the open positions without having another one land at the same spot. So whenever a bonbon teleports to an armor stand positioned at the machine, it will change its entity tag which limits the remaining animatronics to only teleport to any other spot. This brings us to the final part of the system, where another timer is going to start, this time counting down to when the armor stands fall back into the machine if we don't manage to hit them in time. This should give you a good idea of what this is going to look like while it's finished. Now obviously there's still a lot we need to do, but you can see that each of the bonbons appear in a different position randomly every time, then they appear for a few seconds before then disappearing, and that cycle just continues throughout the entire minigame. Now right now, as you can probably notice, this is only set up for round 1, as all of the bonbons are only appearing at the few positions in front of us. When round 2 starts, they'll then be able to go to the 4 on either side, and then when round 3 starts, they'll then be able to go to the additional holes all around the machine. This part got pretty messy and complicated very quickly, as adding in the other three animatronics meant more restrictions needed to be made, adding a lot more to each of the command blocks. With the way I had things set up, if even one number was wrong, it would cause the armor stands to overlap or even stop them from working at all. While Bonnet works in the exact same way as Bonbon, bon, Helpy and the plush babies both have a less percent chance to appear, and will both work differently once their main mechanics have been added. That's something we'll think about in a minute though, but as of now, everything is working the way it should. I've now got the main basic setup of the minigame all completed, so now all four characters have a chance to appear at one of these first seven positions, including Helpy and Plush Baby. Even though Plush Baby only appears at round two and three, I wanted to make sure that everyone had their movement set up and they could appear in any of these positions. So what we'll do next is add in all of the other positions for future rounds, but for the time being, I next want to move on to the actual mechanic of hitting them, so that way we can earn points and push any of the animatronics back. In the original game, we would use a mallet to hit them, but for this recreation, I'll be using a shovel. Now finding a way to keep track of when I hit the armor stands without having to break them did take a while to figure out, but I eventually thought of using a baby zombie to act as the hitbox. Unlike with armor stands, any damage dealt towards normal mobs is able to be tracked, meaning it can be connected to a scoreboard. To first make sure the zombie doesn't act like it normally would, I removed its AI and then made it silent, that way it doesn't get in the way of the armor stands. From there it was as simple as teleporting a zombie for each armor stand, and then linking it to a 
command block that detects whenever I hit one. This was my first time using something like this, but it worked perfectly as now when the zombie takes damage, it will teleport the connected animatronic back under the machine. Now I do want to go into a bit more detail with this since it is my first time using this command. So these three command blocks right here are what work for the Bon Bon animatronics. And as you can see, it starts out as a basic execute command, but this right here is what actually detects the damage, the hurt time 10S. This is the part that detects when the entity takes damage. And for our example, we're using an entity with the tag BBBB1Z, and that's because that is the zombie that is teleporting to the first Bonker Bon armor stand. From there, once that execute command detects that the entity has taken damage, it's then going to run this next execute command here, which is just teleporting the armor stand down by three blocks. Now this is the same thing for all of the other armor stands, but then we have this last command block here which is going to reset our damage, so that way every time we hit something it's not going to keep the counter at 10, and instead it's going to go back down to 0, so that way every time we hit an animatronic it's then going to be able to lower it down by a certain amount of blocks. Now this works fine for the first three animatronics, but as I've mentioned we need to hit plush baby three times, so I needed to make a bit of a different setup to get this to work properly. So unlike the first three animatronics, when we hit the armor stand for plush baby, it's not going to immediately teleport the armor stand back down again, and instead what it's going to do is power this second setup here, which is going to change the entity tag of the zombie. This makes it so that we need to hit the baby zombie two times, before then the command block will be able to trigger the command to teleport the armor stand back under the machine. So as you can see, whenever a plush baby is active, we need to hit it once, then twice, then three times before it's been completely pushed back. And by using the same detection commands I just used, I was able to set up a score system that kept track of points. Hitting a bonbon animatronic will give us one point, bonnet will give us three, and every plush baby will give us five points when we hit them three times. However, as I mentioned earlier, we can also lose points by hitting helpy, which removes three points every time we do so. Every round these numbers will be added or removed from a scoreboard, which now shows off how many points we have at the side of the screen. From there, it was finally time to add in the round system, so that way we have a goal to reach and can let the animatronics appear at more positions. Round one starts when we hit this red button, which will then start a 30 second countdown, limiting the amount of time we have to earn points. This countdown is always going to be displayed to the left of the machine by having an armor stand change its name every second all the way until it reaches zero. To the right of that is another named armor stand, this time showing off the points needed to beat the current round. If we reach that goal, then all of the animatronics will stop moving, so that way a quick tutorial on how to deal with the plush babies appears in between rounds one and two. From there, every time a round ends, more positions will open up for the animatronics to teleport to until round three ends and we beat the minigame. So right now Bonkabon is in a playable state where we can start the minigame and we can also win the minigame. But something we haven't really gone over yet is how to lose if we get jump scared, and that's something I've just finished working on. So as I mentioned, the way we get jump scared in Bonkabon is if we don't hit the plush babies enough or if we don't score high enough in a single round. And these three setups right here are what make that work. This first one right here is going to detect to see if we should get jump scared, and if it powers, it will then start the second setup here, which is the actual jump scare animation itself. Then finally, on this last platform here is really just to restart the minigame, that way if we want to replay it, all of the command blocks are going to be ready to go. So if I go ahead and put a redstone block here, you can see that we get the quick jump scare animation of plush baby, and then we get taken to the game over room. Now here we have two different options set up, with the first one being to return to the hub to play something else, or if we want to, we can hit the retry button to play the minigame again. Now I think for the long run, it might be best to have multiple game over rooms set up, that way we don't have to worry about teleporting all over the world when all of the minigames have been added, and also it's just going to make things a lot easier by having the game over room right next to the minigame it's connected to. Going off that idea, I also decided to build a dedicated prize area for when we win the minigame, which also has the options to take us back to the hub or to replay the level. This time, however, there's a Cupcake Bonanza Claw Machine next to the table, which will give us our prize when we beat the minigame. There's plenty of different items that we can unlock through this, but when a level is beaten for the first time, a set reward is always going to be given out first, and for this minigame, that item is the Bonker Bond poster. Now the banner might not look like much to start with, but remember that these posters get displayed all around the main hub, so as soon as we leave the prize room, a copy of the banner gets cloned inside the pizzeria for the rest of the game. That now completely wraps up the gameplay and functions of Bonker Bond, but there's still one last important thing I haven't added in yet, and that's to actually get the minigame started. The selection menu is already set up, so all that was needed was some teleport commands connected to the Bonker Bond item, which now takes us to a brand new room whenever we throw it from the minecart. This is going to 
serve as the tutorial screen which will teach us how to play the game by having instructions appear over some player heads. But some levels just like this one have multiple pages of rules, so by pressing a button on the table, a different visual is going to appear alongside some new text to explain it in more detail. The last thing to do is to then press the start button which will take us to the Bonker Bond machine itself and the minigame can finally begin. I honestly didn't expect it to take this long to build this level, it took just over a week and a half and around a thousand command blocks, but now everything has been added and I think it all turned out really well. Now I have gone ahead and added in some final touches in my own time, things like flashing lights around the arcade machine and some much needed sound effects, things I didn't really want to show off now but you will be able to see when we play the final version of the minigame later on. But with that aside, the first minigame of this project has now been completed, but we still have a lot more to go through until we're even close to being finished with this project. Project. So let's not waste any more time and get started working on the next one. Taking a look at the staff only levels, Cold Storage is the first minigame available which has us retrieving a birthday cake from Glamrock Freddy's stomach hatch. The gameplay itself is very similar to the parts and service levels in other FNAF games, which is something I have recreated before, but this time I decided to go about it differently. Unlike that recreation where I built the whole animatronic out of blocks, this time I decided to model Glamrock Freddy completely out of armor stands to make the experience feel a lot more immersive. It took almost an hour to get right, but it was definitely the best a way to go about it. Here's a better look at the completed version of Glamrock Freddy. He's made up of 17 different armor stands, and though he might look weird from some angles, I really only focused on the front side of him since that's where we're going to be seeing him the most. Now since he is completely made out of armor stands, it means we can move around each individual limb however we want, meaning I can recreate all the repairs and animations just like we see in Help Wanted. Since most of this minigame is scripted, it made the most sense to start with the first task we do, which is to melt the ice off of Freddy's arms. The ice itself is made out of using multiple armor stands with ice blocks on their heads, that way we can physically see the ice chunks melt away as they're slowly teleported down. To make this happen, I'll be using an iron horse armor to act as the heater, which will send a command output whenever we're holding it in our hand. But we don't want the ice to melt away by just holding the item, as we need to actually be looking at the ice to interact with it. So by using this very lengthy command that detects whenever we're looking at a specific entity, the output now only works when we're looking at the individual armor stands that have ice on them. However, we can still take this one step further by adding an on and off toggle to make sure the heater isn't always being used. This works by using a custom scoreboard that detects whenever we're crouching, and then setting up a command block that sends an output when we're doing so. Now when we're crouching and holding the item, the system will power and start to melt the ice. Once we're done using it, this crouch scoreboard needs to be set back to zero when we stand back up, that way it limits the command to only work when we're holding down the shift key. Then as one final detail, I also decided to add a particle command to trigger when the heater is being used, that way we can see steam appear as the ice is melting away. The next task is a little more complicated, as now we have to open up Freddy's arm casings to add in a fuse and replace a frozen battery. I spent some time thinking of different ways to make the prompts to do this, and I finally decided on once again interacting with different armor stands. By using the item replace command, I'm able to put a button on the top of their heads, and since it still acts like a normal armor stand, the item is going to get removed whenever I click on it. Linking this to a command block that triggers when that happens, the armor stands for Freddy's hands turn grey before another the armor stand teleports into place to make it seem like the casing has opened up. There's also some additional items that appear at the same time to make it look like the wires and endoskeleton of the animatronic. Now this next part has us use multiple different items, so before continuing with the gameplay, I quickly added in the toolkit that sits on the desk in front of us. Three different armor stands are used as actual item slots, which will let us pick up and put down the different tools we use throughout the level. This won't just be used as a gimmick either, as just like in the main hub, I'll later be limiting the amount of inventory space we have to stop us from holding more than two items, just like if we were playing this in VR. So with that sorted, the next step is to take out a frozen battery from Freddy's left arm, which once again has more ice on top of it that needs to be melted. Once it's gone, we'll be able to take out the iron nugget that represents the battery before we can then put in the spare one from the toolkit. The way I'm able to switch out items like this and make it look like it's actually there is by having another armor stand positioned under each arm, which still shows the item it's holding even if the armor stand itself is invisible. 
From there, we only need to insert the fuse into the other ROM by using the golden nugget. It doesn't matter if this is done before or after replacing the battery, but both need to be used to move on to the next step, and that's to stop the battery from overheating. As soon as this section starts, a scoreboard timer will start counting up to 15 seconds, which is how long it takes for the battery to fully charge. However, if it's not cooled down during this time frame, the battery will start to burn up before the timer ends, and Freddy would then jump scare us. This is when the fourth and final item is needed, as using the cooler on the battery will cause the countdown that would otherwise cause it to overheat. Finally, to show off how much time is left, one last armor stand is used that keeps having its name changed until the 15 seconds are over, which is when the timers are all going to stop and the task gets completed. After that, the next step is to remove both of Freddy's eyes and then press his nose to open the faceplate and expose the endoskeleton. This is where things get a bit tricky, as though these steps are pretty straightforward, there's a lot of different animations that need to be made, which involves even more armor stands. Starting with the eyes, two small armor stands with custom player heads will teleport right in front of Freddy's face to make it look like his eyes are popping out of their sockets. At the same time, Freddy's player head gets swapped out for one with red eyes, which is just a small detail to show the ender eyes behind his normal ones. Once they're both removed, it will then start the next step, which is to press Freddy's nose. This time I wanted to use something besides another armor stand, so I thought of using a baby zombie in the same way I made Bongabon work. However, the zombie hitbox ended up being much bigger than the area for just the nose, so I replaced it with a silverfish, which worked out a lot better. Now, just like before, whenever the entity takes damage, it will send a command output, which will then trigger Freddy's attack animation. Now, since I'm working with armor stands, there's a lot of different values I need to keep track of, like their poses and coordinates, so before starting on this, I made sure to have a backup of Freddy's default position inside some command blocks. I then spent quite some time messing around with different positions to try and recreate the final frame of the animation, that way I had both the first and last frame set up, and could later add another position in between the two. When I thought everything looked good, I then added some teleport commands for the arms and the head to make it seem like Freddy is leaning forward when he tries to grab us. Finally, to wrap up the animation, the commands are going to play in their reversed order to put Freddy back into his default state for the next task. This is when the endoskeleton comes into play, as next we need to press a button inside its jaw to deactivate it. So with another armor stand, the endo head will start teleporting just in front of Freddy's normal one while his attack animation is playing, and will stay like that for the rest of the game. As for the button, a second armor stand is positioned right in front of the endo's mouth, which we'll have to take in order to move on. The twist to this though is that the endo's mouth is constantly opening and closing, which makes it difficult to press the button without getting jump scared. To recreate this mechanic, the button an armor stand will have the item quickly removed and then added back to its hand based on a set timer, which gives us a fraction of a second to interact with it. However, by using the cooler item, the delay gets increased to give us more time and a better chance to hit the button. And this isn't the only time the cooler needs to be used, because the endoskeleton itself starts to overheat the more the mouth opens and closes. A timer starts as soon as Freddy's attack animation ends by having a scoreboard timer constantly increase, but it will go back down again if we start to use the cooler. As more time passes, some flame particle effects will start appearing around Freddy to indicate he's overheating, which will eventually lead to the jump scare. If we manage to hit the button before any of this happens, however, all of the timers will then reset, bringing us to the final task of the minigame. This is the part where we can finally open up the stomach hatch to reveal the cake inside, but it's still held back inside a metal cage that needs to be unlocked. Starting by taking the chest plate off the armor stand, a teleport command will slightly move parts of Freddy back, so that way there's more space to work with and to make the interactions a lot easier. Now in Help Wanted, when the chest plate is removed, the object will just phase through the ground when we drop it, but since I didn't want to recreate that for this build, I decided to add a brand new storage space to put the armor onto once we've taken it off of Freddy. Right next to that is one last storage slot which holds the spare birthday cake to later replace the one inside of Freddy. Speaking of which, the chest cavity was the next thing I added in using five more armor stands, one for the cake slot, one for the iron bar cage, and three for the chains surrounding it. Each one of these play a part in the next gameplay sequence, as the chains will start to heat up after the chest plate has been removed. This uses the exact same setup as every other scoreboard timer I've used so far, where we have to use the cooler item for a set amount of time to stop the flame particles from overheating Freddy. So once the timer for this section ends and the chains have been cooled, the iron bars will move away to finally let us take the cake inside the hatch by clicking on it. By doing this though, one last sequence is going to start, as removing the cake triggers a timer for the jump scare. This is where we can finally use the spare cake and put it in place of the one we just took, which is then going to stop the timer from counting down and finally marks the end of the minigame. 
since I've almost finished everything with this minigame, I want to go ahead and compare this to Bonkabon, as I originally thought that this minigame would be a lot more complicated than that one, when really it was the other way around, and this ended up being pretty simple, while still having some things that took a while to figure out how to do. However, I've now gone ahead and made all the commands to reset the minigame itself, and this was definitely the most complicated part of it so far, just because of the sheer amount of things that need to be reset. So much so that I had to split it up into four different rows, just to keep track of what's actually going on. There's also this entire row of different armor stands here which are all holding a different item that needs to be replaced in the actual armor stands in the game itself, like the tools for the toolkit and even different parts of Glamrock Freddy that also need to be changed. Then there's also all of these armor stands directly under the floor which are going to stay there until they need to be teleported up, and some of these also need to have their hands locked to stop us from taking an item, or even just to remove an item that we put there in the first place. So all of these commands here are just going to reset everything back to the way it was before we even started playing the minigame in the first place. So the next thing I can now do is add in Glamrock Freddy's jump scare itself and then go ahead and link it to the system here, that way I don't have to worry about breaking any of the commands in the process. The jump scare for Glamrock Freddy ended up being a lot more complicated than the one for Plush Baby, as instead of animating a single armor stand, I once again needed to move multiple at the same time. Luckily the animation is very similar to the one I made earlier, so it didn't take too long to put together and to make sure it all still looked good. From there the jump scare leads to the game over room which has the same options as before, where we can either replay the level or go back to the hub. The same goes for the tutorial room at the start of the game, where I just needed to swap out the instructions and player heads to explain the gameplay of this level instead. Finally is the prize room after we beat the minigame, but this time instead of getting a poster as a reward, we get the full model of Glamrock Freddy to put on the stage in the hub. Now for the time being I don't want to go overly complicated with how I do this, as I know eventually I'm going to have to set up even more animatronics, and by then I'll most likely think of a better and more efficient way to do this. But right now the way I want to set this up is to have a chest in a minecart have all of the animatronic heads of the animatronics we've unlocked, so that way once we beat a minigame and unlock an animatronic, its item will be added to a chest in a minecart, and all we'll have to do is stand at this position in front of the stage, then go ahead and throw the item from the minecart, and it will then put the animatronic on the stage. It wouldn't have really worked well if I used the same Glamrock Freddy armor stands I made for cold storage, so I ended up making a completely different model, but this time made it a lot more compact, since it doesn't need any gameplay features. And just like I said, the way we put the animatronic we want on stage is by throwing one of the heads from the menu, which will then teleport each one of the armor stands up by the amount of blocks needed. For the minecart to actually appear though, I took inspiration from the minigame selection menu by once again using a sign to send a command output which will teleport the minecart on top of us. Now in total there are 37 animatronics we can unlock, but there's only 27 spaces in the minecart, so eventually once more animatronics have been unlocked, I'll then polish this to have a second menu, as well as put them in the same order as the gallery in the actual game. But that now completely wraps up everything to do with cold storage, with a total command block count of exactly 499. This was probably one of the minigames I had the most fun playing in Help Wanted, and now it's definitely one of the ones I'm most excited for trying out in Minecraft. Before we do that though, there's still one more minigame I want to recreate, so let's go ahead and move on to the third and final minigame of this video. Instead of being an original game like the other two I've made so far, Ballora Gallery is a remake of the same section in Sister Location, where we have to cross the room as quickly and as quietly as possible without disturbing Ballora. However, she isn't the only thing we need to watch out for anymore, as Help Wanted 2 also adds the mini arenas and even the biddy babs to the mix, which makes it even more challenging to get to the exit. Aside from that though, the gameplay itself is probably one of the more simple in the entire game, as we just have to simply crawl from one side of the room to the other, but only if Ballora's music isn't playing. If we get too close to her or move when we shouldn't, it's an instant game over. Now you might be wondering why I made two different versions of Ballora, and the answer is because that's what Help Wanted does. The Ballora that appears on stage before the game starts is actually a completely different model to the one that physically moves around the room. So this Ballora is going to be on the stage, and then when the game starts it will be teleported down here, and then this Ballora will teleport up into the room, which is the one we need to watch out for. Now this might seem unnecessary, but it honestly makes things a lot easier by not having to give a single armor stand multiple different purposes. Before we start on any of that though, let's first take a look at the player mechanic of crawling through the room. The last time I recreated this, I just had the player stand up like normal but with a slowness effect to make the movement seem a lot slower. But I can definitely do a lot better this time and have us actually crawling on the ground. This is going to work with a single command block that will constantly place an invisible barrier block directly above us which forces us into the crawling position. So now no matter what direction we move to, another barrier will always be placed there to keep us crawling for the entire game. 
game. Now, while we can keep crawling forwards and backwards as much as we'd like to avoid Ballora, there is a limit to how far left or right we can go to make sure we stay within the boundaries of the game. The first thing to stop us is a barrier wall on either side of the path, but getting too close to it will summon the Biddy Babs to start chasing us. Throughout the entire level, the two Biddy Babs on either side will keep up with our position, so that way if we do get too close to them, they don't have to travel as far to jump scare us. And that's exactly how this is going to work in Minecraft, as both Biddy Bab armor stands will start five blocks outside the main path, but they'll always keep up with our speed by teleporting alongside us. With the movements all set up, I next use the command that detects whenever we're in a certain distance of the armor stands, so that way we can have the Biddy Babs teleport towards us if we're within their range. But to help limit how far they can move, I put two rows of light grey concrete directly under both of their positions, and then set up the teleport command to only affect the entity if that specific block is directly under them. To then make it look like the Biddy Babs are actually crawling, I lastly added a quick two-frame animation that definitely adds a whole lot more to the chase sequence. Now if we get close enough to the area they're in, the Biddy Bab armor stands will keep crawling towards us until it triggers the jump scare. Now since I'm this far into working on the Biddy Babs mechanic, I thought I might as well completely finish this entire part of the game by adding the jump scare to it. And this might just be my new favorite jump scare animation I've ever made, as not only does it work really well with a smaller scale, but the addition of the faceplates opening up by using additional armor stands really added to the final look of it. With the Biddy Babs fully added, the next thing to work on is Ballora herself, who as I mentioned earlier starts on the stage in the room before she becomes active. Her mechanic starts with a scripted event, as once we crawl far enough, a command block will cause the light blocks on the stage to flicker before the Ballora armor stand teleports under the map and the game officially begins. Now at this point it could have been a lot easier to make more scripted events like this for every Ballora encounter, but I wanted to make things a bit more random. So instead I decided to use a scoreboard that increases every time we move to keep track of how far we travel. Once that counter reaches a specific number, a command will then teleport the second Ballora armor stand up into the build just a few blocks in front of us. From there we now want the armor stand to move from one side of the room to the other and I ended up using the exact same method as the Biddy Bab chase sequence to only teleport the armor stand if there is a certain block under it. However I can't just simply make a layer of blocks under the floor like last time as if it were all one type of block, Ballora would only be able to move from the right side of the room to the left or vice versa. And if I were to alternate different blocks there's a slim chance that the armor stand would get stuck in between the two and wouldn't be able to move at all. So instead of having a row of blocks always under the build, right Right after Ballora teleports into the room, a row of blocks will get filled relative to the armor stand's position, which will then let it move around the room no matter how far ahead of us it is. Then once the armor stand makes it to the end of the row, all of those blocks will get removed to stop any confusion for the next time Ballora appears at the same place. So now that things work going one way, I next made a 50-50 randomizer to determine whether Ballora will start from the left side of the room or the right side. If she appears towards the right, a row of blue concrete is placed under her to make her move towards the left, and if she appears towards the other side of the room, a row of red concrete is placed under her which will move her in the opposite direction towards the right side. Then after linking up this system to the movement detection command from earlier, this cycle will keep on repeating until we reach the end of the room. However, there is one exception to this, as once we're close enough to the exit, there's not enough space for Ballora to spawn in front of us, and instead she'll start appearing behind us. To get this to work, I've placed a layer of yellow concrete under the floor at the end of the room, and then set up the randomizer system to stop working if it detects that there's yellow concrete under our position. I then made a second randomizer, but switched up the commands to only work if there's yellow concrete under us, which will then power the commands to teleport Ballora behind us. Now for the entire time, Ballora has only been in one position, so to finish everything up, I finally went ahead and added in a proper animation for her. What makes this different from any other one I've done so far though, is the fact that the Ballora model has multiple other armor stands attached to it, so I had to be careful and make sure that they're still connected the right way when she's moving around the room. To then finish up Ballora's mechanic, I next added in the jump scare animation, which can be triggered in two different ways. The first is the most simple, as a command will power the jump scare if we're in a certain range of the armor stand, but the second has a little more to it. Once Ballora appears in the room, the movement counter gets set back down to zero, so that way if we move while Ballora is there, another command will detect it and trigger the same jump scare. This leaves one last detail that I've waited until now to add, and that's the music box that plays to let us know when Ballora is active. Now you might have expected me to recreate the song out of note blocks, but I actually remade the whole thing by using command blocks. Not only is this a much more efficient and compact way to make it work, but I can also have each of the play sound commands executed at the position of the Ballora armor stand, meaning the music will grow louder as she gets closer to us and will start to fade away as she leaves the room. 
The final animatronics to go over are the mini arenas, who play a pretty big role in the game as they will lure Ballora to us if we let them get too close. Starting by putting two rows of lime concrete under the floor, when the mini arenas teleport into the room ahead of us, they'll slowly start to move in our direction. Once they get into a block and a half range from us, the lime concrete under them will get replaced with a different block which will stop them from moving completely. Now this is when their main mechanic is going to start as at the same time they stop moving, a large area under the floor will get filled out with a different type of block, which is what will make Ballora change direction if she crosses over it. Now since this area isn't a straight line like before, it means that I can make Ballora take the quickest path to us by moving diagonally instead of taking a sharp turn right in front of us. If this happens, it's pretty much game over as the blocks will keep on moving Ballora towards us, eventually leading to the jump scare. However, we are able to quite literally push the mini arenas back as just before they get close enough, we can pick them up and throw them away. In Minecraft, the way this works is a little different, but it once again worked best by using a zombie to act as the hitbox. Instead of just simply teleporting under the floor once they take damage, however, a teleport command will move them a few blocks outside the main path to make it look like we pushed them far away. Then their position gets reset back to the platform under the end of the room, that way they're already in front of us for the next time they appear. Now instead of appearing at random like Ballora does, the mini arenas have set times they become active at, which is always after Ballora starts moving. So I made a new scoreboard to keep track of every time Ballora appears, and then set up teleport commands to move the mini arenas into the room after the second, fourth, and sixth Ballora encounter. From there, everything works together properly and completely finishes the mechanic. To now wrap up the entire minigame, there's only a few final touches needed, like the time limit we have to cross the room. And I didn't notice this during my first playthrough, but the exit door will slowly start to close throughout the game, which is a small detail I also added into this map. As the scoreboard timer counts down, a different frame of the door gets copied into the build, until the fifth frame closes it completely and triggers Ballora's jump scare. Finally, the last thing needed were the three rooms for the game over screen, the prize room, and the tutorial room, which all link up to the hub and the mini game itself. And just like how we unlock Glamrock Freddy in cold storage, once we beat Ballora Gallery, we unlock the Ballora model to put in the hub. So the last thing to do was to link up the gallery menu with the new Ballora model, which now lets us put her up on the stage if we throw her item from the minecart. And that now completely finishes everything I wanted to do for this video. Three different minigames and the main hub, totaling to around 2,500 command blocks. And all of this is just the start of the project, as there are still plenty of other minigames to recreate, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how I'm going to do it. But now that I've gone ahead and playtested through each one of the levels to make sure everything works without bugs, it's finally time to show off everything from start to finish. However, I'm not going to be doing things like I normally would, as instead of just playing through the games normally, I'll be playing through each one of them in VR as I think that'll make things a whole lot more fun. So with that being said, it's finally time to see if we can survive these three different Help Wanted 2 minigames in Minecraft. I hope that you enjoy it and let's see how we do. I keep forgetting how big Minecraft in VR actually is, as I gotta be honest, the first thing I noticed when I got in is how much smaller this looks compared to the Help Wanted 2 lobby. Now this might just be because everything inside is a lot bigger which makes the actual room smaller, but I couldn't help but notice that and yeah, I thought that might happen, actually. So I set up the cupcake to look at you always. But it works even better in VR. Look at that. That's that. That's great. <laughs> we like that. So there's some things in VR that I'm really excited to try out. And that's one of them. Because if I was just playing normal Minecraft, this thing wouldn't be able to follow me if I was just standing still. And I'm just standing still on the same block, but moving my head side to side. And the cupcake's following me, that's great. There's a lot of features like that, that I'm really excited to try out. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. So the minecart just appears right on my head. That's a bit disorientating. All right, there we go. So we've got three different mini game categories that we've actually set up. Let's just go ahead and do them in the order we made them. So we'll start with Bonkabon in the Fazcade. Bonkabon, score big on the Circus Babies Entertainment and Rentals, both popular game of skill. So to start, let's go ahead and get right into it. I'm in a black void, <laughs> great. I need to get used to the scale of Minecraft. I I'll hope sooner or later I'll get used to it, but for now it's gonna be, it's gonna be really surprising every time we do something new. Bonk the buns to get a high score, don't hit healthy. See what the next tip is. Flush babies take more hits, don't let it get to you. All right, let's go ahead and get started. How is this gonna be in VR? Yeah, once again, a lot bigger than I was expecting, but also it's really cool. I gotta be honest, like building your own Minecraft maps and then like playing them in VR is really cool. Now, I'm curious, can I? Yes, that works. 
Now, I don't know if I'm going to keep on using that because I might hit stuff on my desk. So we'll just, we'll just, I'm just going to hit the button to hit the animatronics and they're, they're already, they're already at it. Hello, Helpy. You just keep on staring at me like that. Yeah, I'm just going to use the button. I don't want to hit anything on my desk. That would be bad. I don't want to end up breaking something. There we go. This VR headset is already as old as it is. I don't really want to get a new one right now. Can I hit Helpy on accident? This might actually be a bit more challenging in Minecraft, since the zombie hitboxes are a bit bigger than the animatronics in VR itself. But let's say we're doing good so far. I haven't hit Helpy too many times. I say as I... That's lucky that didn't count. That would have hit you on accident. I'm sorry, Helpy. <laughs> See, last thing I hit. Brown finished. We should have won that. Yeah, we only need 20 points. We got 68. So we're doing pretty well. Is there plush baby spawns? Yep, there you are. This takes a lot longer to hit. I, I definitely should definitely just use the button, actually. Round two, let's go ahead and get started. Three, two, one. And now they're going to spawn from all of these positions. So let's get ready for that. There we go, plush baby spawns right there. I need to pay attention for her the most. Just keep at it from all sides. It, again, with Minecraft being a lot bigger, it actually makes things a whole lot more challenging because now I have to look further left or right instead of this all just being surrounding me. Yeah, the, the hitboxes in VR are definitely a whole lot different than normal mode. But honestly, I'm having a whole lot of fun doing this. Gotta be honest. Playing this in VR normally in Help Wanted and now in Minecraft, really cool experience. Really happy with how this has turned out. Flush baby, get rid of you quickly. No, don't get jump scared now. We're doing really well. There we go. We only need the 60 points. Round win. We got 147 points. Yeah, we're doing really well. I might have actually made this a bit too easy, but it's just really easy to get points in VR. So here we go. Final round. Let's not mess this up now. I just hit help you on accident. Honestly, we're doing fine on points though, so I'm not too worried about it. Let's keep on at it. Spawning everywhere. I think the help you just spawned in twice. Next one where... Yeah, it's spawning everywhere now. Only on the side. Alright. Keep at it. There you go, more. Get rid of the plush baby. That's the biggest problem, is I just want to make sure I get the amount of hits needed to get rid of the plush babies. Like that. Go away. There we go. Six. We should be good, though. Four, three... No, I, I tried not to hit Hulpy, but he was in the way of Bon Bon. There we go. Alright, round finished. There we go. 120 points. We got 197. So close to 200, but... I say we do really well for that. That was a lot of fun. Honestly, wasn't expecting that to be as challenging as it was, but it was a whole lot of fun to play out. So let's go ahead and get our reward. This is terrifying. <laughs> Honestly, I wasn't expecting these rooms to be as ominous as they are or be the scariest part of the game in general. But just having a black void around me, I'm not a huge fan of that. Let's just go ahead and get our reward. And we're actually holding the present. That's awesome. And we got the Bunker Bomb poster. So now if we go ahead and return to the hub, we should see... The Bunker Bomb poster is right there. That's really cool. So eventually, once I start adding in all of the mini games and we start winning them, we're then going to be able to replace all of these light gray banners with the official ones. And that's going to be really cool. That's probably one of the things I'm most excited for in this series is having the pizzeria upgraded as we progress throughout all the different mini games. Let's go ahead and move on to the next mini games. So that's going to be in staff only and it's going to be cold storage. So cold storage, birthday time. Glam Freddy requires assistance delivering a very special birthday ice cream cake. So to start, let's go ahead and get started. Now let's see how big Glamrock Freddy is actually going to be. I'm a bit nervous about that. Find and recover Jimmy's birthday cake from Freddy's chest cavity. The next tip, use the heat gun to depress Freddy, but don't let him get too hot. And finally, use the tools to complete repairs. All right, let's go ahead and see. I Just considering that's how big Freddy's head is going to be, I'm braced for it. <laughs> yeah, uh, gotta be honest, this is definitely a whole lot bigger than Glamrock Freddy is in Help Wanted 2. Wow. It's cool though. Again, I can't get over the fact of just being in Minecraft and this model being right there. This is cool. This is really cool. All right, so let's see how this works. So I have the crouch button set up to just a button so I don't actually have to crouch in real life. So I can just do this. And it works a whole lot better in VR. This is what I was talking about earlier with the cupcake. There's some features in VR that are just going to work a whole lot better than they would in flat mode. And I don't have to physically crouch and instead I can just hit a button. And it does that. Makes it a whole lot more immersive as well, so... Let's go ahead and melt the ice. Do things one step at a time. It's very loud. <laughs> I hope everything is recording right as well. It's been a long time since I've recorded any form of VR video. So hopefully my audio is okay. Everything is recording right. And hopefully it'll be a whole lot of fun to watch. So let's see. Hopefully I don't hit my wall doing this. I just hit the button actually, so... Go ahead and take this. Put it in its place. 
open up the other arm and this is when we need the heater again so let's go ahead and grab that and melt that now what i'm noticing it seems that it's only following my cursor so i can look around as i'm doing this and i only need to have my hand pointed towards the ice that's melting not the actual direction i'm facing so i can look wherever while i'm doing different tasks and that's gonna be great for future levels where i need to multitask all over the place so that's good to know for future reference hopefully by the time we're far into the series i'll be used to it let's go ahead and put the other battery in and start cooling down freddy we don't want them to overheat that's another feature as well actually in flat mode it was a bit difficult to see the timer going up and i was considering moving it above freddy's arm actually but having it in vr be right there and i can see it properly that works a whole lot better. That, that's great. That works just as well, I honestly. That looks ridiculous. Let's go ahead and take it out. So one eye, again, really weird just holding it. Put it there. It grew all of a sudden. All right. <laughs> these, have, these eyes are massive on these armor stands. All right, so I wonder if I can just hit the entity or if I actually need to press the button. Might just press the button. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's, that's really good in VR. And I need to remember, I'm actually playing the game, so go ahead and cool down Freddy quickly and grab the button. There we go. Got it. All right. Awesome. That wasn't too difficult, actually. Go ahead and put this back. Grab the chest plate, if I can find the hitbox for it. There we go. Put it there. And then grab the cooler back because, yep, he's going to start to overheat again. So let's go around in circles. Make sure we cool all of the change. We don't want any part of Freddy to overheat. Just keep at it. There we go. All right. Final task, let's go ahead, grab the cake, if I can find the hitbox. Hopefully I don't hit my monitor. There we go. All right, swap the cake if I can. There we go. Put in the new one. No, nope. there we go. <laughs> Took a bit of chesting out there, but there we go, we got it. And that is the second mini game all completed. Honestly, that was a lot of fun as well. Really enjoyed that, how that worked. And Freddy, once again, being a lot bigger than I was expecting him to be in VR. But let's go ahead and unlock our reward. We get another birthday present and we unlock Glamrock Freddy. So let's go ahead and go back to the hub. And now we can go ahead and see what he's going to look like up on the stage. So let's go all the way to the stage. Go ahead and click this sign. There we go, we've got Glamrock Freddy unlocked. So let's go ahead and put him right there. And this model is definitely a lot more accurate to how big Glamrock Freddy should be. Let's go back to the main terminal and see him from far away. Yeah, that's definitely a whole lot more <laughs> accurate compared to the one that was in cold storage. But that's really cool. I really like that. And that's something else I'm looking forward to as well. There's a lot of things I'm excited for in this series. But having all of the different animatronics up on stage by making different models of them like that, that's going to be really cool to see them all eventually. So let's go ahead and move on to the third and final mini game, And that's going to be over in Sister Location and the Ballora's Gallery. So dance, welcome to Ballora's Party Room and Dance Studio. Now here's a fun fact. Any level in Help Wanted, whether it be Help Wanted 1 or 2, any room where it's completely pitch black, I absolutely hated. And that was probably my least favorite level in Help Wanted 2, just because of how terrifying it was being in a pitch black room. I'm not excited for this one in Minecraft, but Ballora is looking for you. Don't let her catch you. Get to the exit quietly. Stay away from Ballora and the mini arenas. Right, let's see what this is going to look like in VR. Hopefully not as bad. I'm facing the wrong way. Obviously, teleport commands don't work the same way in VR. That is ominous. <laughs> this is already pretty ominous. There's the exit at the end there. And there's Ballora up on stage. All right, let's see. Let's see what fresh hell this is going to be. Hopefully it won't be as bad in Minecraft, but let's see. It's, it's still bad. It's still very bad. I hate the dark. And this is just pushing that phobia to the limits right now. All right, well, we have to go, though, because we're on a time limit. So just inch slowly. Don't take things too quickly. Listen for Ballora's music. The, the fact that she's just going to come out of the darkness here. I'm not looking forward to that. I'll listen to the music. I think we're good. I'm just going to wait a little bit longer. Let's keep on going. Slow bits. I don't want to move too quickly and then we end up getting jump scared because we move too fast. This sucks. Oh god. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah, this makes them even bigger just be crawling on the ground like this. That's, that's very ominous. And she's just gone. I can't imagine what the beady babs are going to look like, actually. Do I want to see what the beady babs look like in the darkness? I kind of just want to beat this level, honestly. All right, let's keep going. Listen for the music. Move slowly. You can... Okay, that, that scared me a bit. So the, the mini arenas are active now. Laura passed by again. You can tell this is a bit different from Help Wanted 2, as instead of just grabbing the floor, 
I have to actually hold the move button. So I have to be a bit more careful with movement since it's a lot more sensitive. Alright, Ballora's gone. Move a bit oh, God. That's so ominous. Alright, what's the hitbox? I don't want Ballora to jump scare me. Alright, there we go. There we go. Alright, and they're gone. Alright, we're safe to move on. At least for the time being. Slowly. Bit at a time. My hands are shaking. <laughs> I don't know if that's easy to tell or not. Alright, let's pass by, please. It's not as bad, because I could see Ballora in a much more clear view, instead of just being a shadow in the darkness. I, that I appreciate. But just the popping out of the darkness all of a sudden like that is still a bit nerve-wracking. Alright, keep moving. Small bits at a time. Can't even see the exit anymore. Stop moving. I think the mini arena spawned again. Pass by. Hopefully don't get too close. And my, my thumb is completely off the trigger, and I don't want to accidentally move while we're here. Wait for her to leave. Hopefully. I don't know why I turned around expecting something to be there. I'm the one who made this game, so I don't know why I have the paranoid feeling that something's following me. That'd be bad. I don't want that to happen. Alright, let's keep going. We're almost there, I think. It's, what, sequence 5 now? Alright, only a few more. Going slowly and surely, we should have plenty of time to make it to the exit. However, I still want to take things slowly. Don't mess anything up. Wait for it to leave. There we go, we're good. Alright, keep walking. A little bit at a time. I can see my cursor in front of me. It's, it's confusing me a bit. Alright, the mini arena spawned again. A little bit of pass by. I can't get over how big Minecraft is. It's been so long since I've played in VR. Alright. Keep going. There we go, I think we're safe. Again, they, oh, every time. Every time. That's, that's so much bigger than they need to be. Alright. We should be near the end. Ho hopefully. But she's still sporting in front of us, so we've still got a bit more. Hello. Pass by. <laughs> Something else I'm worried about as well is if just in case the mini arenas did end up getting too close to me and all of a sudden Ballora just charges in my direction. That's gonna completely catch me off guard. Alright, slowly. We should eventually start seeing light in front of us once we get close enough. Don't get too close just in case. We are very close actually. That's something that's a bit difficult to notice as well, is in flat mode it's kind of easier to tell how far away you are from entities. But in VR, since I'm moving my head, it makes things a bit difficult to know whether I'm too close or if I'm okay. That's behind me. Oh god, I don't like that. That is, that is terrible. Alright, we're almost there though. That means we're almost there. Man, I wasn't expecting this to be like this, honestly. I mean, flat mode, it's easy. I'm not worried about flat mode, but VR horror gets me every single time. There's the light. We're so close. And the door's almost closed. Come on. We're so close. Ah, oh, that's not good. <laughs> we were so close there. Oh, come on. We were right there. All right. I'm not going to cut that. We're going to keep on going. I'm going to try this again. All right. There's mini arena spawned. I'm trying to move faster this time. But that means I do get a bit closer to Ballora, which I don't like. Again, I did all the testing for this in flat mode. And it's one and a half blocks needed for the jump scare to trigger. But I don't know how that translates into VR. So, that's what I'm nervous about right now. I don't want to end up being too close to Ballora if the jump scare is going to trigger. Keep going. We're almost there. Yeah, I can start to see the light. We're almost there. Oh, how, how much is the door closed? Hopefully not a lot. We're so close. We're so close. Alright. Laura. One more time. Wait for it to go. 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 Oh, it's right there. Come on. There we go. Okay. There we go. Just in time for Ballora to get us. Alright, there we go. It wasn't as bad as it was in Help Wanted. But the darkness surrounding me I still did not like. Alright, go ahead and unlock our prize, which is going to be Ballora. So now if we go ahead and go to the hub, if we really wanted to. There's Ballora on the stage. I much preferred Glamrock Freddy. 
there we go that's all three levels done honestly i had a really good time with that playing them in flat mode is something on its own but experiencing minecraft in vr having a game recreated in minecraft is really cool i'm really excited for the future levels this was a ton of fun and i really do hope that you enjoyed watching this as I mentioned during the gameplay, I only tested the three levels in flat mode, meaning I didn't experience the jump scares in VR. So that Ballora jump scare was the first time I've actually experienced it, and again, I think it all ended up working really well in VR as well. But there's still more of them to check out, so let's go into VR one last time and see what they all look like. But that is now going to wrap it up for today's video. As always, it was a lot of fun to put together, so thank you all so much for watching. And if you did enjoy, then make sure to leave a like and subscribe with notifications turned on, that way you can keep up to date with all of my newest videos. Until then, however, thank you again for watching, and I will of course see you in my next video.